If you like this kind of content, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where you'll get early access to my tutorials as well as the unedited full-length videos. Hey guys, welcome back to this second part of the Obi-Wan Kenobi tutorial series. In this video, we're going to be going over some of the techniques that I use to get the most out of my UVs. We're going to be setting up our texturing XYZ maps for projection inside of wrap. We're going to be doing some cleanup work on our wrap planes inside of ZBrush, a little bit more cleanup work inside of Mari, and then we're going to be using these maps to displace on our sculpt. So the first thing that I want to do is to export my model at the correct subdivision level. So the subdivision level that I've chosen to export at is at subdivision level 2, and I'm actually going to delete subdivision level 1 because it's not really necessary anymore. After that, I'll go down to the export tab and make sure that the scale is set to 1, uh, make sure that grouping is off, and then export that and import it into Maya. Inside of Maya, the first thing that I want to do is to set the model's real world scale. And so in order to do that, I will just go to create polygons and to the cube option box. And in the values, I will put 24. You can see here that I put 27 and that's just a mistake. I, I'm not really sure why I've put 27. Maybe it's a uh, values that I've had from a different project, but the extra three centimeters isn't really going to make a big difference, but I would set it to 24 centimeters instead of 27. So then I'm just going to scale up my head model until the top of the head and the bottom of the chin roughly lines up with the scale of the cube. After I'm happy with the scale of my model, I will delete the cube and then go into the channel box where I want to take note of the scale XYZ values that I'll be bringing over into ZBrush. Back in ZBrush now, I just want to input that scale value into the export tab and then export the model back out again into Maya. So once you've imported that newly scale model back into Maya, you'll see that they're exactly the same scale and you can delete the old one. We're now ready to start UV mapping our model. The goal of UV mapping is to get as close as possible to a one-to-one -one match with the polygons and the UVs. However, we also want to promote the polygons that will be seen the most and give those the most amount of UV space. So some squashing and stretching in areas that won't be seen too much is acceptable. I'll start off by opening up the UV editor just to check what UVs my model may already have. I'll also apply a Lambert shader with a checkerboard texture and turn on hardware texturing in the viewport just so I can see the effect. The checkerboard texture really gives me a good idea of where my UVs are being stretched and the closer they are to being squares, the better. Like I said in the previous video, this model already has quite nice UVs, but I want to make the most out of this texture space and so I want to split it up into two UDIMs, one for the head and one for the neck. I'll select the edge loop around the neck where I want my UVs to split and then I'll use the cut tool to separate those two UV islands. I'll then go in and start moving the UV islands around and scaling them up until I'm happy with their placement. I'll then go through the process of just pushing and pulling the stretched areas of my UVs with soft selection enabled. Like I said, the goal is to get an even distribution of undistorted squares on the main areas of the model that will be seen most by the camera. I think it's always going to be difficult to try and get perfectly undistorted and even UVs throughout the whole of your model. There's always going to be areas that are extruding outwards that are going to be more difficult, like the ears or the nose. But as long as the texture map squares are squarish, you should be okay. When it comes to the ears, I don't want to squash them too much, but at the same time, I'm not being overly careful either. You basically have to decide which areas of your model should be sacrificed to give other areas more UV space. And I think the ears can be sacrificed a little bit, unless you're focusing on rendering ears. I 
I tend to try and match the same UV selection on either side of the head just to try and get a more symmetrical look to my UV space. But again, I'm not being too over particular here. I'm basically just eyeballing the same scale at this point. For areas that won't be seen on the model, such as the back of the head or the neck, I don't mind squishing the UVs quite a lot in these areas in order to preserve the space I've given to the rest of the face. I just do the exact same thing as earlier and try to grab an even amount of UVs on either side and then just push and pull them with soft selection enabled into position. Once I'm happy with the general position of the UVs on the face and the back of the head, I'll select those areas with soft selection disabled and pin them. I'll then select the rest of the UVs and press optimize, which will just relax those areas that are unpinned. Just like before when I was squashing the UVs on the back of the head, I want to try and make sure I'm picking an even amount of UVs on both the left and the right hand side. I do this by just going in and manually selecting and unselecting certain points before I pin them. Lastly, I'll start to just go into specific areas that need fixing and use the techniques that I've been using previously just to try and get the UVs as even as possible. After that, I'll export the model out to be ready to be imported into ZBrush. Back inside of ZBrush, I'll go to the lowest subdivision level or the subdivision level that I exported out from and then I'll import my newly UV'd mesh. My ZBrush model now has UVs. So we're now ready for the texturing XYZ wrapping stage of the process. So the first thing that I want to do is to create a decimated version of our model to stop any faceting that might happen once we wrap a polyplane around it. To do this, I make a duplicate of my subtool and then go into the highest subdivision level. I'll then go to Z plugins and to Decimation Master, where I'll press Pre-Process Current. Once that's finished processing, I will then lower the decimation percentage and then click Decimate Current. Once I have the decimated model, I'll then export it out ready for the next step of the process. So back in Maya now, I've imported the decimated mesh and now I want to create a polyplane by clicking on the little options box. Looking into my texturing XYZ image folder, I want to look for the dimensions of the image. I can see that it's 9824 by 6190. So I enter that into the height and width options in the little options box for the polyplane. So I enter 98.24 by 61.90. I play around with the subdivisions for a little bit here, but I eventually settle on 250 by 160. I'm looking to try and get the polygons on my polyplane mesh to be as square as possible. Next, I'm going to assign a Lambert material to the polyplane and then apply my texturing XYZ color map to the diffuse slot. I have my hypershade on my second monitor at the moment, so if anybody's wondering how my image browser just appeared there.
I turn on hardware texturing so I can see the image in the viewport. And then I turn normalization off in the inputs menu. Once that's all set up, I'll uniformly scale down the plane until the eyes, nose and mouth roughly line up with the model. Then I'm ready to export the polyplane for the wrapping process. So now I'm in R3DS Wrap. This is a very cool piece of software by a company called Russian 3D Scanner. I'm using the standalone software here, but they also have a plugin directly for ZBrush that will just do the exact same thing that we're about to do. For any students out there, Wrap is totally free for you to use also, so I can highly recommend downloading it and giving it a try. The first thing that I do in here is to load the polyplane that we just created and the decimated head model. I do this by just creating two load geom nodes and naming them appropriately. I'll also load in the image that I want to line up to, in this case the texturing XYZ color map. And then I'll turn off wireframe just to get a better view in the viewport. And then next I'll create the select points pairs node and then the wrapping node. So now I'll start connecting up the nodes. It's important to keep the connections of the nodes on the same side. For example, the polyplane is wired to the left input of the select points pairs node and the left input of the wrapping node. And it's the same thing for the head. The head is connected to the right input on the select points pairs node and the right input on the wrapping node. If these wires are crossed, it's going to cause some problems. One last thing to make sure of is to make sure that your select points pairs node is also connected to your wrapping node. Once we have all that connected and set up, we can then select the select points pairs node and switch on sync views, then go into the visual editor tab at the top of the screen. I can now start the process of creating the points that I want the software to line up to. So for every point I create on the image, I also need to create its point pair on the model. It's really important that your numbers match on the image and the model. So one on your image must also match one on the model. If they don't, it's going to cause some errors. Because we're working with so many points, it can be easy to miss the number that you're working with. Sometimes we think we've clicked a point on the model, but it doesn't actually show up which can really mess us up further down the line, so it's just something to be conscious of. If you ever want to delete a point, you can just press Control and left click on it. You'll notice as I'm working my way through this, I'm creating a point at the bottom of the closed eyelid on the image, and then I'm looking for where that point would be on the model with the eyes open. This is going to cause some texture stretching inside the eye because the gap is just so big compared to the gap on the upper eyelid to lower eyelid in the image, but it doesn't really matter too much because we'll be painting this out anyway uh, when we come into Mari. I don't have to be super accurate with this when I'm matching the point pairs, but that being said, the closer match between the image and the model that you get, the better your wrap will be in the end and the less cleanup work you'll have to do later on. The main thing is, is just to get your numbers to match. So I'm going to speed the video up here so I don't bore you to death. I'll just continue to work my way through the process of creating those point pairs. Watching this recording back, I'm surprised I didn't put more points where the two lips meet. I would usually create the points around the outside of the lips and then I would put a few points on the line where the two lips meet in the middle. But unfortunately this time I mostly just forgot to do that. When it comes to lining up the pairs on the ears, 
I'll disable the sync views on the select points pairs node. This way I can rotate the model without rotating the image plane also. Unfortunately, the ears are always notoriously difficult to get a good wrap to, so there's always going to be a little bit of cleanup work once we come into ZBrush and Mari. Once I'm happy with the layout of my points, I'm ready to start the wrapping process. So I'll go to the Viewport 3D tab again, and then go to the wrapping node, and then by pressing Compute, this will start off the process. This will either take a few minutes or maybe a quarter of an hour depending on your system. Once it's finished computing, you'll have your wrap model. As you can see, there are some problem areas that I talked about earlier around the eyes and the ears which we're going to clean up in ZBrush and Mari. But all in all, it does such a nice job of conforming to the geometry, and this is going to give us some really nice results later on. To save out our newly wrapped model, I create a Save Geometry node, and then I browse to the location where I want to save it. After that, I just click on Compute Current Frame. Now that we're back inside ZBrush, I want to append a new Polymesh 3D subtool and then import my wrapped plane. The wrap has done a really great job of aligning to the model, but there's still a few tricks that we can use to get this looking even better. I want to view my texturing XYZ color map on my model so that I can see a little bit better where the problem areas are. I'll go up to the texture tab and then import my XYZ texture, making sure that the flip V coordinate is on. And then I'll go to the texture panel and assign the image to the wrap plane. I also like to use the skin shader material here with it because it just enables me to see the texture a little bit better. I'm going to flick on wireframe here so that I can see what's happening with the geometry. I've noticed that wherever I've placed a point in our 3DS wrap, the geometry around those areas is a little bit messed up. So I'm going to go in with a low intensity smooth brush and just relax that topology around those areas. I think this is just the best way to fix this. I'm also using the move topological brush to move some areas around that I think are out of position. This process can be a little bit time consuming and boring, but the more that we do now fixing things in ZBrush, the less time we'll have to spend in Mari later fixing up the textures. But it's up to you where you feel the most comfortable and want to spend your time. I'm just working my way around the model now and trying to remember where I put those points in in R3DS rep. Usually if there was a point, there will be some kind of geometry distortion. So I want to make sure that I find all of them. I'm trying to push back that extruding piece that's underneath the chin into a better position now. And I'm also making sure that I don't move areas in the rest of the wrap that are in the correct position. And like I said before, it's always a little bit boring to do this kind of stuff, but it will be worth it in the long run. I can be a little bit aggressive when I'm pushing and pulling these different areas into position without worrying too much about misalignment issues with the rest of the head. 
We're going to be doing some geometry projection shortly, which will project those areas back into the correct place onto the surface of our head model. By enabling the visibility of our head model in the viewport, I get a better idea of where the details of the wrapped image should be sitting. A lot of this process now is just looking at both the models, spotting the misalignment issues, and then pushing them into position as best as I can before we start the projection process. Like I said in the wrapping stage, the ears are always problematic and it will probably take the longest to fix. I just continuously rotate around my model and try to look for the outer edges and the main cartilage forms of the ears to try and see where it's broken. I'll then just use the same process as earlier as using the move topological brush and try and rebuild those structures around my head model. Once I'm happy with a rough first pass of fixes that I've made, I'll then subdivide my mesh once and then go to the subtool tab. And with only the head model and the wrap plane visible, I'll go down to project and project all. This will project all of my wrap plane to the geometry of my head sculpt in order to get a closer match. I can also move specific areas of the wrap plane and then mask those areas out. Then I'll invert the mask and then project all again, which will just project the model in those masked areas and not the whole model. Like with everything during this process, even with the projection stage, there's still some cleanup work to do. Because of the stretched geometry around the eyes, the projection didn't work so well here. So I'm just using the clay build up brush with the alt key just to push back that geometry into the eye hole. In the wrapping stage, I talked briefly about not putting enough points on the line of the lips. And because of that, I'm having misalignment issues where the two lips meet. And so I'm gonna to have to do quite a lot of cleanup work here to try and push that geometry into the correct position. Everything has a knock-on effect when you're working in 3D. And if you don't pay enough attention when you're placing your points, the more you'll have to fix it in ZBrush, and the less attention that you pay in ZBrush, the more you'll have to fix it in Mari, and so on and so on. This kind of thing always happens in production studios. If a character modeler doesn't have correct UVs on a model, for example, that's going to cause some issues in the texturing department. And then if they're late into the production, it might go to lighting where they might be asked to hide those messy textures in shadow. Every action or inaction has repercussions. So try to take pride in your work. Try to do the best you can at every stage because it will save you so much time and effort later on.
Once I'm happy with the second pass, I'll subdivide my model once more and then project all. I'll then smooth out any areas that are problematic, just like the second pass, and then I'll export that at its third subdivision level, ready for the texture projection in wrap. So now we're back in 3ds wrap and we're ready for our texture projection transfer. The first thing that I'll do is to create two low geom nodes as I did last time. But in this case, I'm going to use one for the cleaned up wrap plane and one for the UV model at subdivision level two. I'm also going to create an image load node and plug in the texturing XYZ color map. I'm going to turn off wireframe in, so that I can see the viewport better. And then I'm going to create the texture transfer node as well as the extrapolate image node. I'm only connecting the wrapped image for now because as soon as I plug in the UV head model wire, it's going to start the texture transfer process. So before I want that to happen, I'm going to go into the texture transfer node and I'm going to set the width and height to be 8K. Once that's done, I can now start the texture transfer process. Once that's finished processing, I can view it in the viewport 2D tab, and then I can save it out. To save out the image, I'll just create a save image node, and then select the location that I want to save, and then press compute frame. I'll then do the exact same process for each of the displacement map and the utility map. Before we can start to apply these newly projected maps, we need to do a little bit more clean at work, but this time in Mari. To start a new project in Mari, I will go to File, New Project, then I will name my project, in this case I've named it Ewan, and then in the browser box I will search for my UV head model. I'll then go to the channels tab and select the types of map that I want to either create or edit. In this case, I just want to create the diffuse color and the displacement. So I'll deselect the others that are ticked on. I'll set my displacement color space to be raw and then I'll change the size of both my maps to be 8K. After that, I can create my new project. One thing to mention at the start of this is that I've set the bit depth of my displacement map to be 32 bit. Now normally this would be okay, but ZBrush unfortunately can't handle the input of 32 bit files. 
So I'm going to be changing this a little bit later on to be 16 bit. So now that I'm inside of Mari, I can start to edit my maps. And the first thing that I want to do inside the displacement channel is to go down into layers and create a new layer. And then I'll right click on it and go to import, import into current layer. And then I'll select my newly projected displacement XYZ map and set the color space to raw because I want to work with raw values. I also set the view transform to be raw at the bottom of Mari's viewport because I also want to view these raw values in raw. Next, I'll create a copy channel layer. This allows me to view one channel at a time and will also help me export out the individual RGB channels a little bit later on for ZBrush. For now, I'm just currently viewing the red channel. Next, I'll go into the UV tab. This just lets me see all of my UDIMs all at once. And then I'll go to my base layer, then to the color picker. Because we're working with linear values on our displacement map, I'll set my value to 0 0.214, which will give me a 50% gray value. 50% gray on a displacement map means zero displacement will happen once we apply it to the model. I'll then paint this value onto the whole of my model on the base layer. Now that that's set up, we can start to edit our texturing XYZ layer. I've set my brush to be clear at this point, which wasn't the smartest idea. It's not really a big deal at this point, but I'm essentially deleting the information on this layer when I paint in. I should have really used a non-destructive method of creating a mask and then painting in black the areas that I didn't want. Like I said, it's not too much of a big deal because I'm only removing the areas on the back of the head and the neck and places that I know that I will want to remove just from experience. I've just switched to the green channel in the copy channel layer, just so I can see the details of my map a little bit better. With a soft brush, I'm looking for any super dark or super bright areas of my map that I know will cause issues when I'm applying the displacement in ZBrush. Essentially, any areas I'm removing now will need to be hand sculpted in later when we come to the ZBrush stage. The eyes are always the most difficult thing to fix when we're using the texturing XYZ maps for two reasons. One is because the eyes on our model have the eyes open and so there's a lot of distortion on the upper eyelid where the texture is being squashed. And the second reason is the eyelashes on the image. Again, because the eye is closed on the image, the eyelashes overlap a big portion of the lower eyelid, which makes them essentially unusable. In the past, I've spent hours trying to rebuild these areas inside of Mari, but I've come to realize that it's much easier to remove that information there and just to sculpt back in the detail by hand after we displace the map on our model. Basically, anywhere on the head where there's a hole or a piece of skin that overlaps another piece of skin, like the folds of the ears or the nostrils on the nose, they cause these kind of light and dark lines to happen in, in the texturing XYZ maps. It's just the light that's catching on the little hairs on the skin. But because of this, it will push and pull our geometry when we come to displace, and so these need to be removed.
On this Obi-Wan project, I actually ended up using two displacement maps to get the look that I wanted. Everyone has a different skin type, dry to normal, oily or combination. And from looking at the reference, I could see that Ewan had more of an oily to combination skin type just from looking at the pore shape and size. And I wanted to reflect this in the details of my model. The first displacement map that I created had more of a dry skin type, but I knew that I also had a female oily skin type that I could use. So I just repeated the same wrap process as earlier and imported this into a new layer in Mari. In this new texturing XYZ layer, I decided to go down the non-destructive route and created a mask and then set the value to black. And with my mode set to normal, I start to paint out the areas that I don't want with a soft brush. This is the process that I should have used when I imported the first displacement map, but it's all water under the bridge now. I'm painting out the areas on the chin because I believe that the female skin will be too soft in these areas. I'm also using the same reason for the underside of the nose and the top of the lip. Now I'm starting to paint out the back of the head and the head cap, just like I did with the first displacement layer. Next is the eyes. I want to keep all of that nice wrinkle detail on the eye bags in the first displacement layer. So I'm just masking out those areas in the second displacement layer. It's important to look at your reference during this stage. Try to figure out what kind of detail your maps will give you and what you will need to sculpt in later. A lot of this knowledge also comes with time and just completing various projects. I'll try to make things as even as I can on both sides of the face when I'm masking, both with the intensity of the mask and the overall size and placement of it. I'll flick the visibility of the layer off and on to give me a better idea of the symmetry and which areas need more work. The last layer that I need to create now is the projection layer. We'll use a projection of the displacement map to paint over the areas like the hairline and the eyebrows just to remove them. First, I'll import my displacement map that I want to project into the image manager and set its color space to raw. Next, I'll create a new layer and then name it projection and then drag my image from the image manager into the viewport. This will activate the projection brush. I line up my image and scale it to the correct size, using the layer below as reference as to how big the pores and wrinkles are. To scale the image, I can use control, shift and left click. To rotate it, it's just control and left click. And then to pan the image, it's just shift and left click. Once my image is set up, I'll then go in and project the image onto the model. For the hairline, I'm only interested in adding the detail to the parts which will be visible to the camera. So anything that's going to be eventually covered up by hair is not really a concern.
for the eyebrows, I'll try to line up the size of the eyebrows on my image to the previous layer. And then I'll pan the image down so that the skin detail is now over the previous layer's eyebrows. Then with a soft brush, I'll project the skin detail down onto the mesh, doing the same process for the other eye. On the mouth, I'll do the exact same thing, lining up to the scale of the details and then projecting onto the mesh to add some more information in there. Some people have quite large forms on their lips and other people have quite small lines and wrinkles. Again, it's important to look at your reference and try to get an understanding of what your maps will give you and what you might need to sculpt in later. Lastly, I'll take one final look around my model to check for any areas that I might have missed and fix any of the abnormalities that might be happening in my maps. Once I'm happy with my map, I'll go to the copy channel layer and select either the red, green or blue channel. I'll then go into my displacement channel and right click and go to export flattened. I'll set the file type to raw and then export that selected color channel. In this case, it's the green color channel. I'll repeat this last step for the other red and blue color channels, changing them in the copy channel layer before exporting them out. This will give you three displacement maps, R, G, and B, that we'll be using in ZBrush. However, for this project, I only ended up using the green and blue channel displacement maps inside of ZBrush. So, now we're back in ZBrush, and we're ready to use those displacement maps. Because I'm using two UDIMs on my model, I will have two maps for every color channel, one for the head, and one for the neck. To get this to work inside of ZBrush, I'll first need to split my model into polygroups. To do this, I'll go to polygroups and then select the auto group by UV. To view the polygroups, I'll just turn on the wireframe. I also want to divide my model as much as my computer can handle. I'm currently working on a six year old laptop at the moment, so this caps out at around 10 million polygons for me but if I could go up one more subdivision, it would be really beneficial. Now that we have the polygroup set up, we can start to set up the layers. In the first layer, I want to create the base layer, and this will just hold the information of the model at its current state. After that's been named, I'll create the layer for the R, G, and B channel displacement maps. Like I said earlier, I didn't use the R channel in this project, and so I'll be starting with the green channel. 
I'll start by naming it and making sure it's in recording mode and then select the head polygroup with control shift and click. I'll then import my G channel displacement map for the head UDIM. I'll flip the V coordinate and make alpha. In the UV map, I'll set it to 8K. I'm not sure if that's necessary, but it's just something that I've always done. Next, I'll create a new texture in the texture tab. And then down in the displacement tab, I'll bring in that displacement alpha and adjust its intensity. To make sure I'm getting the correct intensity on my displacement map, I'll start to rotate around the model and get the specular highlight to roll across the details. I probably could have gone a little bit more intense looking back at this, and I did end up making the height value to about 1.2 inside of Maya when I came to render it. Once I'm happy, I'll just apply the displacement map into that layer. Now, by selecting the inverse of my polygroup, I'll do the exact same process for the neck. I'll import the second UDIM for the green channel, flip the V coordinate and make alpha. I'll then load it into the displacement slot and then use the exact same intensity value as earlier and I'll apply it to the layer. After that's done, I can go back to the layers tab and create the blue channel layer. I'm not sure why I've turned off the G channel layer at this point. It's not necessary to do that. So again, I'll just do the exact same process. I'll import my B channel image for the head UDIM and flip the V coordinate and make alpha. I'll open it up in the displacement slot and play with the intensity to something that feels right with the micro displacement. After that's done, I'll then switch to the neck polygroup import my image for the blue channel and the neck UDIM, flip the V coordinate and make alpha, and bring it into the displacement slot and apply the exact same intensity as I did with the head. Once I'm finished with my XYZ layers, I then like to create another layer for the morph target. This layer isn't really necessary, it's just something that I like to do to make sure that my displacement isn't deforming my model too much. At the highest subdivision level, I'll store a morph target without my displacement layers enabled. I'll then go back up, enable those layers, and then go to subdivision level one. From there, I'll go back to morph target and use the slider and set it to 100. The best thing about using this layering method is that I can adjust the intensities of the different layers to get a different look. 
I end up changing the green and the blue channel layers to about 0.65, but there's no real magic number here. You've just got to play around with it. Lastly, I'll create one more layer for some generic noise. In the noise panel, I'll click on noise. I'm just looking for something very subtle here. I don't want to interfere with any of the previous layers too much. Just something that will give me a little bit of breakup on the areas of the maps that were painted with 50% grey and didn't displace on the model. And I think this is where we're going to leave this video. I also wanted to show my detailing process in this one, but there's quite a lot to talk about and I didn't want to cram it onto the end of this one. So in the next video, we're going to go over the process I used to really define those details and get them to really pop, as well as going over some sculpting practices and how to get your eyes to look lifelike and expressive. I hope to see you in the next one. Cheers guys.